the other part of that, uh, which is when heaven gives its seal of approval to another family, that new person or family is justified in rebellion. Uh, and I should mention, heaven is not a personal God that sees over things. In Confucian thought, it's, a, it's kind of an impersonal moral force. All right. Um, so the mandate of heaven is closely associated with the welfare of the common people. And, and I'm going to give a, an example from Mencius. This is for, from the founding of the Zhou dynasty. Um, the last dynasty, the Shang dynasty, had a ruler named Zhou. Different character, different uh, pronunciation, kind of confusing. But that last ruler was a very corrupt guy. Uh, he um, uh, was cruel and oppressive and uh, lost the mandate of heaven. And then in the fighting that came, he actually uh, was killed in that. Um, there was a, a king who was talking to Mencius, asking about that particular uh, uh, episode in history. And he said, he asked, may a minister then put his sovereign to death? Now, notice what a politically loaded question this is. This is a king who's saying, is it ever appropriate for somebody else to kill a king? And Mencius said, he who outrages the benevolence proper to his nature is called a robber. He who outrages righteousness is called a ruffian. The robber and the ruffian we call a mere fellow. I have heard of the punishment of the fellow Joe, that's the last cruel king, but I've not heard of putting a sovereign to death in his case. So he's saying that he sort of lost that, that kingly imprimatur, that, that, that seal of approval, and then, yeah, those kind of people can be killed. All right, this is dangerous stuff. Um, the founder of the Ming Dynasty in China, this is in the early 1400s, so he's new into, into this, this empire, and he doesn't want to hear any justifications for other people rebelling against him. He disliked these ideas in Mencius, and he halted the sacrifices at Mencius's ancestral temple. And in fact, he tried to get rid of about a third of the book, the Mencius, all of those passages that touched on the right of rebellion. Okay. Some of the earliest economic analysis in Chinese history um, comes from Mencius as well. I mean, this is an important part of statecraft. There was a philosopher named Shuzi who suggested to, to Mencius in conversation that it would be beneficial if everything had a set price so that no one would take advantage of even a child who went to the marketplace, right? You send a kid with some money, you could just read the prices, give it, and, and he won't be at a disadvantage in negotiating uh, these prices haggling. Mencius replied that that didn't really make sense. If, for example, every shoe of the same size were sold at the same price, why would anyone work harder to make a better quality shoe, he said. Um, he also encouraged trade, which is a little bit of a change from Confucius. Confucius once said that the superior man cares about doing what's right. The inferior man cares about making a profit. There's sort of a, a hesitancy about market uh, um, values there. And, and Mencius thought the trade was important. He also thought the division of labor was something that, that could be a, a good part of a, a well-organized society. Um, he came across a, a king who was proud that he farmed himself right alongside his subjects. And when he talked to him, though, he asked this king, so you, you're growing your own grain, that's great, but where did you get your cap? Where do you get the pots that you cook with or the plows that you use? And the king says, well, I don't make those myself. I have to barter for those. Mencius says, why then would it be bad to barter for rulership, right? Some people might give food and clothing to a particular individual in return for good government, for administration. Mencius says, some people labor with their minds and others with their strength. Um, and then finally, he encourages a well-field system as a way to ensure limited, sustainable taxation. Okay, that needs more explanation. The Chinese character for a well, um, it looks like a tic-tac-toe uh, uh, board, or, like, um, or maybe like the pound sign. And the idea there is to divide up land in that shape and then have eight families all have land around the outside, and then there's one square in the middle. They all farm that together, and the, and the produce the, uh, from that middle square pays their taxes for everyone. So, limited, sustainable taxation. Okay, that idea was talked about later on in Chinese history. It never really got off the ground. It was pretty hard to, impl to, to implement. But Mencius is thinking along these lines of practical uh, administration. Now, 
don't get me wrong here, Mencius doesn't exactly celebrate capitalism. That would be pretty anachronistic. Um, and indeed, the beginning of his book, The Mencius, um, starts with a famous story, and I'll paraphrase it for you. He went to see King Hui of the state of Liang, and the king said to Mencius, You've come all this distance, I'm several hundred miles. You surely must have something to profit my kingdom. Mencius said, Why talk about profit? All I have is benevolence and righteousness. If you ask about profit for your kingdom, then your ministers are going to ask about profit for their families, and commoners are going to ask about profit for themselves. I mean, everybody all down the line is going to follow your example and say, so what's in it for me? In a kingdom with a 10,000 chariots, very large chariot, the king is going to be killed by a vassal who, who owns estates worth a 1,000 chariots. And in a smaller state, a 1,000 chariot state, then the king's going to be killed by a vassal with a 100 chariots. Even a hundred chariots is a lot to have, but when profit is put before righteousness, no amount can satisfy, right? Even if you have a hundred, even if you have a thousand, you always want more. Now do you see, I'm, I'm, this is Mench is still speaking, now do you see why I teach benevolence and righteousness? Why bother to mention profit? Sima Chen, the great historian about 100 BC, I talk about him in, in a lot of lectures, I'll have a whole lecture about him later on, he writes a biography of Mencius. He actually writes biographies of, of most of these early thinkers. And then he has a, a, a personal um, reaction, response at the end of that chapter. And he says, whenever I read the book of Mencius and I come to the passage where King Wei of Liang asks, how can I profit my kingdom? I cannot help but set my book aside and sigh saying, alas, desire for profit is surely the beginning of ruin. Okay. I always like that image because Sima Chen hasn't read more than the first page of Mencius before he sets it aside with a sigh. Alas, profit's going to be the ruin of everything. It's self-interest, let's say. It's going to be the ruin of everything. Okay, we're now going to move to the second great mind in this lecture, and this is Shunzi. Um, Shunzi lives from about 300 to 210 BC, so he belongs in the next generation of Confucians after Mencius. In contrast to Mencius, Shunzi was a prominent, respected political advisor whose writings are essays rather than records of conversations. He was a major figure in the Jisha Academy in the state of Qi, a, a fairly prominent state, and he lived to see most of China conquered by the rising state of Qin. Um, that's Q-I-N. Uh, that's an important name. We're going to pick up that story in the next lecture. Shunza believed that direct observation and the record of human history left no doubt that human nature is evil. Um, okay, maybe not quite evil, I mean not in the sense of cruel and depraved, but certainly selfish, self-interested. Nevertheless, he says, enlightened self-interest can motivate people to choose virtue and cooperation. So, and uh, you know, a follower of Mencius might say, well, if people want to do what's right, where does that desire come from? Maybe that's innate. And Shrinza says, no, no, um, everybody wants what they don't have. So just as the poor want to be rich, people who are evil by nature desire goodness. Um, goodness is not natural, but it's the result of conscious effort. So morality doesn't come from innate impulses. It has to be learned, and that's why education is the key. Right? So, so on this point, Mencius and Shrinza are going to be in perfect agreement. This is why they're both Confucians, is they both care about education. For Mencius, uh, you're innately good, but those, those, those impulses have to be nurtured and, and paid attention. Education is important for that. For Shrinza, you are bad at the core, but that can be changed and, and, and improved through education. Shrinza's analogy is that people are like warped wood. Warped wood can be made straight by the application of steam and a straightening board and pressure. So what's needed are teachers and rituals, right? This is Li ceremony that bring out the positive aspects of people and also laws to deter negative behaviors. The rules of conduct are an important part of ethics, but morality is in the end, according to Shunza, a human construct rather than an inheritance from heaven. The sages, in ancient times, came up with the rules of ritual themselves. I mean, they, they work, they're valuable, but they're not the product of revelation. They don't come from God or from heaven.